Hi, and welcome, everyone. Uh, this panel is about women in science and technology. So first, I kind of want to poll the audience of the people here, all genders. Who's currently working in technology? OK. Oh and no, aside from, I, and I got beaten up for this last year, who's currently working in science? <laughs> OK, I remember it this time. <laughs> and, what? Oh, okay, who's in biotech? <laughs> Woo! Okay. <laughs> are there any other fields that I missed that are kind of, uh, kind of fringy? Yep. Yes. Oh no, they're asking engineer. Okay, who's an engineer? Okay, good. Who wants to get into one of these fields? Okay, good. Got some of those. What What other questions should I be asking? I can't hear that at all. <laughs> Something about a science fiction writer. Yeah. What was the question? Who here is a writer that's here for background material? <laughs> <laughs> they, ooh, okay. <laughs> okay. All right. And there was some other. No, go ahead. You ask Just it. curious as to um, anyone in middle school, high school, or college. So, college students. Okay. Any high schoolers? And anybody younger? So the rest of us are all old, right? Oh, so out of college. <laughs> so elder, past college? Okay. 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 All right. And and we will have a Q and A Q &A session, so uh, individual questions can can come up. So I'm going to ask everybody to introduce themselves. First, though, I wanted to start. I, there was a great quote by Michelle Obama. Uh, a couple months ago when she was speaking about her career, having uh, broken a glass ceiling, and then she was asked, well, how many of the shards of glass cut you on mm. the way up? And, and she said that, uh, th this was her exact quote, she said, women, we endure those cuts in so many ways that we don't even notice we're cut. We are living with small, tiny cuts, and we are bleeding every single day, but we're still getting up. And then she, she said that women, we should own our scars. And, you know, the wounds may hurt, but they're going to heal with time. And as women, we must own those scars so we can encourage younger girls who are getting their first cuts. Wow, that's amazing. That was great. Okay, and with that, we're going to move on to introductions. Theta. Name rank cereal. Did I get theta? Theta. 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 Damn it. Okay. 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 <laughs> okay. <laughs> Everybody does it. Yeah. Theta, would you like to start? Sure. I'm Theta Daniels Race, or formerly Dr. Theta Daniels Race, or Dr. Race, as my students call me. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Louisiana State University. Uh, prior to that, same thing, a prof at Duke University, and my area is electronic materials, particularly working on the solid state physics end of things. So I tell people as an EE, I can't fix anything for you, but I sure can tell you about those electrons and molecules. <laughs> Uh, and I'm Jenny Gebhardt. Um, I'm working at the Electronic Frontier Foundation in San Francisco, uh, focusing primarily on consumer privacy and security. Um, I come from an information school at the University of Washington, and before that, I actually came from economics and international studies. So if you have questions about crossing over or mixing fields in any way, I can answer those. I'm Mel White, uh, Dr. Mel White. and. I am one of the second generation of women in technology. So I come from the days of the big iron in computers, the old, I see the nods back there, the tape decks, the card decks, <laughs> drop them and you're dead. That era. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I am currently doing adult education uh, for senior citizens teaching science and technology. Uh, anthropology is one of my main fields, and I've just completed a degree in Egyptology. Wow. Next year, it's geology, because when you hit 65, there is the elder exemption. You can take courses, state universities, anywhere. All you have to do is pay the student fees, nothing else. Ooh. They are never getting rid of me. <laughs> <laughs> is that is that all states or just in as far as I know yes it is definitely in Texas and certainly worth checking out the 
because I've seen the senior exemption. You have to beat up a lot of people <laughs> to, to uh, get them to understand what you want. I went in to do it, and what they did instead was give me a job teaching senior citizens. I went, cool. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, as far as I know, this is in many states. It is worthwhile checking out. Uh, if you have a grandmother, grandfather, uh, parents, you think they might be into this, have them check that out. My dad at age 90 was doing philosophy Ooh. courses because he was tired of sitting around talking to the old guys and wanted something different to do. Yeah, that's cool. Thank you. Hi, my name is Eternal Zan and I fix stuff. Um, <laughs> So I'm, uh, I work for a small company. They do retail and online sales, and I'm the only IT person in our company. So I, I, like anything that runs on electricity is somehow my job. Um, and uh, so like uh, computers, servers, websites, security systems, uh, I learned a little bit about phone systems because our phones keep going out. Um, I'm on the ESO network Dragon Con Report podcast, where our, my regular segment is helping people get rooms for Dragon Con, <laughs> um, which is like the Dragon Con rooms group, if anybody in here got a room from that. Um, and also, I'm a volunteer, and I've helped out with Tech Ops and the Dragon Con store, and I'm also happy that every year they interview me on the 50 Days podcast. Yay! Okay, I'm Kim Stedman, and I work at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Um, I'm an engineer. I got my degree at um, Georgia Tech in aerospace engineering. And uh, currently, I'm working on the Curiosity rover, so I'm an uplink lead for that. And I'm also in development working on the Mars 2020 rover, which will launch in, oddly enough, 2020. <laughs> and I'm, I'm helping define the ops concept and how we're going to do operations when we actually get to Mars in 2021. So on the theme of, of cuts, kind of carrying forward from Michelle Obama, it, I'm kind of asking everyone on the panel, was there a time that someone was just cruel to you or or something happened that you were just saying, it's not worth it, I'm going to go take sewing or, or, or something that was a more traditional field? And and how did you deal with it at the time? Theta? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I'm an expert on bleeding. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, I'm not, but we survived, but right? But you're still here. That's yeah, right. That's yeah. right. Actually, even as opposed to referring to myself for a moment, I'll mention I just came from, um, or I should say was uh, a selected and very honored to be a part of a program called ELATE. It stands for Executive Leadership in Academic Technology and Engineering. And it's for senior women scientists and engineers. They pick a few people from all over the country. It's an arduous process to apply, and you get you know, nominated as I was by the provost of our university. And long story short, there were just a ton of people there. I was just, you know, in a sense, peon as, as a full professor. There were associate deans and vice provosts and all these folks in um, higher education. But just as an example, there was one uh, young woman there, as she called it, you know, not bragging, just saying she had been mega successful. And until she went and to this program and got together with all these women and all the topics we can, can uh, considered from, of course, you know, executive leadership options as well as things like um, Ilanka just mentioned, she said, um, I actually just said to her, oh, you look cool. I said, you, you just got the look, right? And the next day, because she was, you know, just looked just right for an executive leadership academic person, and she came over to me and she said, you know, what you said, I really appreciate it because up until yesterday, I was going to quit. I was going to go do something else, just throw in a towel. And she had all the bells and whistles you could imagine in terms of you know titles and accomplishments. So I guess what I would say is in terms of healing, you never know what one, I'm not saying it was just me, there were other people there, but she did come and thank me for, well, I told her well, she looked great. I mean, you know, um, but, uh, but meaning in terms of just having the presence of being um, an executive leadership person in higher education. So I would just encourage everybody, uh, there's plenty, you can talk to me afterwards if you want to hear the bloody stories, but well, just em. always, <laughs> um, you know, you never know, We're, if you, just a tiny thing you might say of, you know, hey, you look great, or great cosplay, or, or just uh, tell me what you do can make a difference in someone's life that may look like, you know, the all-powerful, successful person. That's what I'd say about it. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I think there's stories that come to mind are kind of extreme stories that really happen once, and then kind right. of the 
things that happen all the time. And it, you start to get used to them and you really shouldn't. Um, and I'll share the thing that happens more than I can count. Um, I'm a researcher in computer science and information science. Um, and sometimes when I'm talking to male colleagues, I'm not sure if they're interested in my research or in me. Um, I see a lot of people nodding. Yes, <laughs> yes, you know. So, and I mean, it's happened so many times that I'm like, oh my gosh, you're into censorship too. This is so great. Like finally someone wants to talk about this and I get really excited. And then later, later I get some texts of like, hey, you want to meet at this club later? I'm like, huh, <laughs> it's dark and it's loud. Not the ideal environment for discussing my research. <laughs> and you start to realize like, oh no, you weren't interested in my research. And that's always really dispiriting. Um, Cause you know, you want people, you want validation, right? And it's, you think you found like this buddy, but like, no, you didn't, you didn't. Unless you're looking for that, which is totally cool too but generally I'm not. Um, so yeah, I think that just happens so often. I start to get used to it and almost expect it. And like now that's my default. Like, are you really a fellow scientist? Um, and I can tell that happened to you guys, so I don't need to tell you. Um, I, don't, I don't think I even have any advice. Just like what I've tried to do is kind of surround myself with like the real buddies, the, the fellow scientists. Um, when you surround yourself with those people, for me at least, it's been so much easier to bounce back from those dispiriting moments. Because I know like, I've got my community, I've got my circle. Um, and then, it, I mean, it, it'll, it'll keep happening, but it gets better and better along the way, I guess. Because of my age, mine has always been an uphill struggle. From the time I was six years old, I wanted to be a PhD. I wanted to be a scientist. But this was in the age when the only women shown as scientists on television or wherever existed to be the prize of the man who is generally a reporter. Uh, when I told my parents I was interested in science, I was discouraged. You should be a ballerina. You should be an artist. You draw well. Mm -hmm. Through high school, I heard this same mantra. When I went out and got a degree in biology. They insisted I get a degree in something that I could teach. And by the way, I could do English as well, so I got a double major. Uh, it hit home really hard when I applied with my degree in biology at a research station to be a research assistant, you know, to go in the lab and help collect specimens and all like that. They gave that to a boy out of high school and set me typing. Um, I got mad enough after this kind of treatment that I said nobody is, I, I would walk in with my degrees and apply for jobs and because of the times I would be pointed toward the secretarial pool. And I finally said I am so fed up with this, I will take computer programming, I don't know beans about computers, I don't even think I like them. But the next time somebody asks how fast I can type, I will say, I cannot type, <laughs> but I can program at 70 words a minute. <laughs> <laughs> and I did, and that was quite a game changer. But then even at that, I ran into constant stumbling blocks. My managers took uh, credit for setting up the entire municipal website, doing all the security, making sure it was hack-proof. I knew some of the people in Cult of the Dead Cow. And when I set up a municipal website and a police website to be hack-proof, it was hack-proof. The managers took credit for that, and it so angered the manager out at um, Animal Control, because I also was one of the first people to put up uh, animals for adoption on the web. And they saw an immediate reduction in number of kills that they did. They hated everything they, they had to kill. They hated killing. He was so angry at this that he uh, got the local paper to do a uh, feature article on me, uh, which annoyed my supervisors no end. <laughs> uh, also had the experience of uh, secretaries husband coming in and he was he was an engineer and he had gotten a home computer didn't matter that I had a master's in computer and had been working on them was one of the first women ever in PC support he knew better about what kinds of programs would be good for their computers they lived to regret that word perfect choice <laughs> <laughs> I told him uh, showing up at computer conferences and being treated as the wife and having to stand there and say, okay, now, 
tell me the specs on that what's the baud rate and stuff and start talking technical to them before they took um, they would understand that I actually knew what I was doing walk up to a, a display of boards and I could tell them what each board was for the final indignity was when uh, the city had run over budget on a system that I told them they really shouldn't buy they were a, a million dollars over that would have paid for many of our salaries for many years to come and so they downsized the women in the department except for the woman who was the lover of the department head and uh, at 55 there were no nobody was hiring a, a woman in computers because how what could grandma possibly know about personal computers so I went off and I got a degree in anthropology as I was doing that they said Gosh, you're asking some great questions. Do you want a degree in uh, information science? Do you want a PhD? Got that PhD at 65, and that's how I ended up teaching senior citizens. Everything I did opened up a new career, and I'm just because you've retired and you've been edged out of everything, once you own your own soul, <coughs> you can do anything still. You don't have to be tied by that. I'm obviously a part of <laughs> So I feel like I was kind of raised to think that, like, I was raised to think, like, you can do anything, you can be anything you want, and I feel like I was maybe had a little bit of the opposite experience where I don't think I was prepared for, I think they're called microaggressions now. Like, <laughs> that's what that, I was not okay. prepared for. Like, I knew I was competent. I knew I knew my stuff. And I also went to a bunch of different schools growing up. Um, like, we just moved around a lot. So it was like an army brat without the army. Mm -hmm. So I know how to be the new kid. Like, that's not a problem. So tr going into a new job was very much, and I, and I have had a number of jobs. Um, I've been at the same job for a long time now. But in the beginning, I've would move from job to job and see what I liked and try different things out. And I, I felt like, okay, well, I have this life experience. I know how to like fit in a new work environment. But for me, the thing I wasn't prepared for was surprise. Like when I'm, I would just start talking to people and be like, we're on the same page, right? But I started off in phone tech support. And so people would be like, saying basically everything but is there a man I can talk to <laughs> you know like like so they'd be like so th their call would get routed to the IT person which is me and so they are talking to me and they're still asking me to talk to the IT person <laughs> I'm like no yeah I'm I'm the IT guy You're, you you got him we're done now <laughs> like, so just little stuff like that where people kind of like have this hesitation when they first start talking to me because they're waiting for me to pass them on to the guy like that's been my most common experience and I feel like I thought we were over that but apparently we're not yet and I'd like to live to see the end of that okay I just have a couple of quick ones um, when I was going to college and I got accepted to Georgia Tech I was of course going to be aerospace engineering and I told a relative that I was going to Georgia Tech going to major in aerospace engineering and she said well you can't do that you're a woman <laughs> you have to do something else you have to either be a nurse or a teacher and I could never be a nurse because I would I'd throw up if I saw any <laughs> bodily fluids. <laughs> so that wasn't going to work and, and I really wanted to do the aerospace engineering thing because I wanted to work in space and that so I, I just ignored her. I have the type of personality if you tell me I can't do something well I'm going to do it and I'm going to rub it in your face. <laughs> That's just me. Not everybody's like that but but yeah so, some people are actually subtle <laughs> but I, I I am not. So, um, and the other one is I was uh, with a coworker. We, were, we, we had gone to a Titan, uh, Titan's a moon of Saturn, and I'm sure you all knew that, though, because this is Dragon Con. <laughs> and we, we had gone to a Titan science conference, and there was a minor league ball, you know, park right there. And we're like, well, for $10, let's go to the, the, the baseball game. So we're in the baseball game, and we're having fun, and two rows ahead of us, because uh, JPL's in Pasadena, California, two rows in front of us, we heard these people talking about South Pasadena. And we're like, hey, you guys from South Pasadena? We're from JPL, blah, blah, blah. And so we're talking, and the guy in between us looks, oh, are you guys here for work? Are you here for a teacher's conference? Uh -huh. And so I looked at my friend and said, I will allow you 
to do this. <laughs> <laughs> and she puffed up her shoulders and she said, I'm an astrobiologist and she's an aerospace engineer and we work on the Cassini spacecraft that's orbiting Saturn for NASA. And he's like, oh my God, I'm such a NASA fan. We're like, don't talk to us. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, sorry, you have anything else? No, that's yeah. it. Yeah. Well, um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I want to talk about the, the 55 thing about getting a job at over 55. It was interesting because um, I was uh, working in, the in, in an industry for over 24 years and then had to go back into the job market. And I'm like, okay, I'm back in the job market. And I'd get my dad calling me and saying, did you find anything? I'm like, no, I'm sending out applications. He says, well, you know, you're over 50. I'm like, how was that helpful to me for him <laughs> to say that? And, and he's like forwarding the article saying difficulty finding a job over 50. And I want to write back to him and say, it's difficult to find a job at any age. <laughs> okay, it doesn't matter if you're white or black or 20 or 50, you go through a ton of interviews before you find a job. Um, so I did find a job and I'm 58. And um, there are some companies who want to hire seniors or people that are over 50 for multiple reasons. One is because they might want contractors and the contractors are already senior managers. And so they want someone with a little, a little gray there because um, it gives them more uh, gravitas to have it. And, and also there's companies, I won't say all companies, but some companies have learned that when you want to have a diverse environment, it doesn't just mean diverse in terms of race or religion, it also means diverse in terms of age. When you have some sort of a brainstorming group going on, you want to get all those different viewpoints. And, and Theda, you have something you often say about it might be the person next to you that's going to help you win the next prize. And, and it doesn't matter what age they are. So you really want to get as many different viewpoints as possible. Um, I also have one more thing that I want to say, what you were saying about people that were talking tech to you and then you found out that they wanted to date. I've had the opposite occur. Um, <laughs> I've had I've, so many times. I would love that. <laughs> <laughs> where, where do you find this? <laughs> I've had guys come up to me and they were flirting and they really wanted to talk and I'm like, I'm feeling like Scarlett O'Hara, you know, and Gone with the Wind, you know, there's guys all around me and, you know, I'm like, okay, where are you? Yeah, let's go talk. And all he wanted to talk about was what I did, which was making games, game development, because <laughs> game dev, like, oh, I can get close to Yolanda by flirting with her. And it got to the point where I really put up walls yeah. all around me. And I found that what helped me is to have a few people that I knew. I wasn't just yeah. meeting at the con, but people that were either relatives or friends. And I was like, let's go to lunch, please. Let's go to lunch. So I'm surrounded by people whose intentions I know. Yes. And, and that would kind of let me kind of recover my, my center and my self-esteem and then kind of go out. And also sometimes if they're, fl okay, let them flirt, you know, <laughs> let them boost my self-esteem, but, but keep those walls. Don't let them get too close until I know them better. Anyone else have anything? So Scott mentioned one of the things, topics that's probably going to come up is Google and this memo that was generated uh, by a Google engineer. Um, Someone else describe. I've been talking too much. Someone else describe it. Well, I, I, I read the whole memo. Did anybody? I read the whole memo. Didn't I read the whole memo? Did, who like show of hands? Who read the whole memo? Okay, yeah. So a bunch of people have actually read the thing. And the, the so for those who aren't familiar with this, a guy from Google wrote this memo where he felt like he was being discriminated against because uh, like Google had groupthink and they were all leftists and the conservative point of view wasn't being welcomed. And then he had like charts and rationales for like how Google could improve. <laughs> um, and his version of improving was basically um, women aren't very smart and we should stop pretending they are. But like, you know, with charts. <laughs> so, but it was like this really high-minded, intellectual-sounding bullcrap that the first thing I thought of was like phrenology, yeah. <laughs> which for those of you who don't know, who was, which was like total bullcrap science where they were saying that African-Americans were inferior because of the shape of their skull. So they're like, oh look, I can draw a picture of a skull, science. <laughs> yeah, so it reminded me of that where like he, he, clearly he already had this idea in his head and then he just like had to make up reasons to support it, but he, the way he did it was really 
was he tried to make it, it it did sound like really intellectual to the point where I'm reading it I'm going that makes sense that makes it no no mm -mm, no and then he got fired so and then I think he's suing and I don't know what's happening after that does anybody know yeah 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 I, so because because Google was like we can't support this guy and I heard that like in Google you have peer review one of the articles I read about the article was that they have peer review, which means that your ability, like if this guy was my boss, he would have the ability to judge my performance and decide whether or not I get a raise. So I definitely agree with the ability to fire this guy because you can't have this guy in a position where he's already made up his mind about who's superior and who's inferior, deciding who gets paid what. That's not okay. I don't know how familiar you are with these groups. There had started out uh, men, what's called men's rights groups. This has been going on for several years, uh, decades actually. Um, and uh, what is happening as they feel they are losing power, as things happen to them, they attribute everything to the rise of people of color, women, uh, cats becoming more popular than dogs. <laughs> uh, it's, it's anything but the fact that they are young, white, and jerks, and they think that they need to be in management positions. Uh, this kind of, to many of us, this will seem like an extremely toxic mindset where uh, we are ruining marriage, heaven forbid, um, and and they attempt to back it up. Uh, a lot of them are intellectuals or at least kind of monotrack intellectuals where they have this one goal that they are going for and everything they read. And they can come up with papers. Yiannopoulos does this. They can come up with papers and facts and things like this that all supports their ideas and it cuts everybody else out. It gives you no agency and then they claim themselves as a victim. So in this case, you know, imagine trying to sit in a group with this m guy and do anything. This was the point of another uh, letter that I read on this. I've done it on internet, trying to deal with these people in a group to make a group decision when they are complaining about how unfairly they're being treated and any suggestion, et cetera, that you make is very negative against them. Um, another outgrowth kind of of this is the sad puppies. Everybody familiar with the sad puppies? Okay, yep, same kind of thought process, same group. Uh, sorry, oh, sad puppies? Oh, God. The attempt, an attempt, I live in a cave. Attempt, okay, <laughs> let, me, let, me, cave. let me send a little light into your cave, <laughs> but go scurrying in the back because this tale started out in an attempt to game the Hugos. Now we remember the what? thrilling days. To gain the what? Hugos, the science fiction. Oh, you remember in the thrilling days uh, when men were men and, and women knew their place, like Heinlein, Asimov, and all like this. We've had too many of these wimpy characters and women, God help us, showing up in science fiction and people of color, God help us, winning awards. The, the Hugos needed to go back to the roots of science fiction and Flash Gordon and manly men. You're not scurrying back fast enough. <laughs> <laughs> and so they put forward these sad puppies. Puppies are sad because their science fiction has gotten so out of away from its roots. A uh, slate of men and or people who did not, sometimes they didn't know they were nominated, who wrote manly men's stories full of science and facts, and they were going to take the Hugos away from those terrible women. That backfired, but the puppies became a movement. They, they attempted again. Um, they nominated somebody. What's, is, audience, help me out. On, yes, yes, John <laughs> Ting. There we are, Ting, Chuck Tingle. Um, go on Amazon and look up Chuck Tingle's wow. books. <laughs> Enough said. <laughs> uh, he he uh, he gamed it too. It, it kind of backfired on them. But uh, yes, so that's the sad puppies. You're still not cowering in your caves. Mm. Uh, 
we can expect, typically you see in anthropology, you see movements like this where the groups will start to be so extreme before a swing back to the center. The question being, how extreme can it go? And it's getting right out there. And, th and there's a lot of fringe groups out there. So in terms of how extreme will it go and, and how much of the society goes extreme with it. Yeah, and unfortunately what we are seeing is because of the types of storytelling that we're doing. Think of movies, how people solve, and television, how people solve things. Two guys with a gun run in and shoot at things. Okay, we are seeing this kind of solution for problems in our society. It's not a good solution. We need some different stories out there. Uh, women in technology are at a high risk of seeing this kind of thing developed, uh, directed at them. You know women writing gamer reviews, Gamergate and things oh, like okay. this. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But anyway, that was a thing. I can just share a quick reaction to the Google memo, and it's not one that I necessarily recommend, but in an effort to just sh be honest and share how I dealt with it, I ignored it. Um, I devoted as little energy as possible to it. I read it. It was not well written. I don't recommend going to read it. Just don't. You don't. You're not going to learn anything. Um, I read it. I was like, well, this is not news. Like, oh, people are using charts to fake science in a sexist manner? Like, no. <laughs> so, That's never happened before. And then I figured kind of, especially as has been my strategy, again, that I wouldn't necessarily recommend, but it's mine, um, has it been my strategy since the election? I figured, like, I'm not going to let this stuff distract me from my work. To me, this is all part of the noise, and separating noise from signal right now is really hard in politics as well as in kind of the tech Silicon Valley world that I live in. And I think, you know, if they're going to distract me from doing my bread and butter security work, then that's how the terrorists win. <laughs> and, and I know that we need engagement, right? We need people to engage. Um, I am a big fan in some ways of the fact that you can't just fire these guys because they're going to go work somewhere else and they will still be in my industry. They'll still be in my field. I think to some extent, some level of engagement and transformation is necessary if we're going to make change going forward. But also sometimes I throw up my hands and I say, like, that's not my job. I have a job and I need to do it. Um, so again, I would not recommend the la 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 method, but sometimes you know you have to conserve your energy, protect your energy, and well, that is what I have done with the Google memo. Yeah, I, I I agree with a lot of that, and just kind of something happens, oh okay, and go back to work and yeah. and do what I do, uh, and and not hear about these sad puppy things or or uh, yeah. uh, other stuff. With with the memo, my feeling on it was that okay, there was a guy who had some incorrect thoughts in his head, and he wrote them. And it was an internal memo at Google. And someone at Google then took that memo and made it public. And then the public went crazy. My feeling was whoever released it, um, maybe they shouldn't have. Maybe they should have left it an internal memo and discussed it internally. Yes, the guy had some incorrect assumptions, so engage and talk to him about them. Uh, the message that I think is being sent here that we need to be careful of, and, and I'm not 100% right, but this is what I'm thinking, um, is that if somebody has these incorrect thoughts in their head, encourage them to express them so that you can then engage and discuss things with them. Yeah, I just want to say real quick, I totally agree. I think it's, I, like if there's somebody who thinks that they're just by default better than everybody else, I want, you, I want to know who you are, <laughs> and I want you to say yeah. that out loud so that I know who I'm dealing with. Yeah, 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 and, and also, I mean, maybe someone is just a narcissist and, and you just want to know who they are, or maybe you can talk to them, and maybe they're a persuadable person, an intelligent person, or maybe not. But um, I, want to encur I always want to encourage people to communicate. That's where I'm at. And there's one other aspect of that that I, you know, that you run into, I'll throw this sort of, you know, monkey wrench in there, is when you deal with that with other women, yeah. right? Because um, I look at it sort of like we're walking warriors or fighting warriors, and even a warrior at times needs a break, right? Sometimes you have to pull back from the front, you know, replenish and go back out there and fight. And it's just a matter of what sort of works for you and in, in your sanity. And I love uh, what Dr. Uh, White said about finding and keeping your soul that's mm -hmm. that's the core that you hopefully and prayerfully no one can ever disrupt people will try 
I mean, it's like, you know, if you think of, I'm, I'm trying to think of a silly analogy, I guess, and for the moment I think of like, you know, uh, a bowl of honey, you know, and ants will crawl on it, you know, and sometimes stick and you got to knock them off. But when you run into it with other women, as I have, it was recently, as the thing I was talking about as well, this, um, it's a year-long boot camp, it was a, a hardcore workshop for a week, and we dealt with personality types, and you got analyzed and all these things, and there was one woman in our group, we had a, a core, it took 26 women, we divided into groups of five or six. And we had to pick a name. And by the way, I'm proud of the fact they picked the name I suggested, which was Optimus Prime. Um, <laughs> and, it's, and it's not because of the Transformers so much. I had like 10 different ideas, and I went, ah, and it just hit my head. And I looked, if you look up Optimus Prime on Wikipedia, and I don't necessarily recommend Wikipedia as a professor, my, kid, my youngest right there, when he said once, Wikipedia is evil, mommy. He'd learned that when he was little. Um, <laughs> but this time, I did just put Wikipedia, I mean, uh, uh, Optimus Prime in, in, in Google. And it came up and it said something like, a being of high moral character with excellent decision-making skills, um, uh, leadership, and uh, strives for peaceful coexistence with all humans. And that was kind of the theme of the, the workshop we were in. But anyway, back to, there was a woman in the group and kind of, you know, word had gotten to me and to others that she wasn't particularly feeling comfortable because there were people at lunch who were discussing, you know, the election and you know who. And she, mm -hmm. she had voted for Trump, right? And uh, now the same person, I don't say these things go hand in hand, but the same person also had, if you want to say out of naivete or just out of her environment, she wasn't around apparently a lot of people of color or people of different religions, everything. So every sentence almost would be things like, oh, I worked for this guy once, he was Indian, and blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to work for any Indians anymore. Oh, yeah, but I met this nice girl. She was Muslim. She was from Iran. She was okay. And I know this black guy, he got this job. I was applying for this job. This is her talking, not me. I was applying for this job, and the guy got it, and, uh, well, you know, he was black. And at that point, we had heard all this. You know, it was bad when I, I was the only African-American person in that conclave, only two in the whole group anyway of the 26 people. And you know, I'll just be blunt, when the white folks get embarrassed for the other person, you know, and you know. <laughs> I mean, they were we were talking outside, there was a bottle of wine there, because you know, some people were upset with their results of their analysis, and mine was good, so I was cool, but. And, and everybody kind of, and I went, okay, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Have you ever had the experience where people uh, like assume you're there as a quota? Oh, yeah, let's, let's do that. Let's talk about yeah. that. Like talk quota. About that. Excellent. Thank you. Not Thank to topic you. jump, but I was just hoping topic we could jump. get to the quota conversation eventually. Thank you. I'll give you my answer for that with respect to maybe others, how they look at it. In fact, what I did when this woman said that, I said, hang up a second. I said, and she goes, oh, oh I didn't mean anything. He was qualified. He was qualified. I said, no, no. I, I said, no, it's no, no problem. It's, it's, it's cool. I'm not worried about that. She had really had some terrible things happen, so I didn't want to, like, bust her chops, honestly. But... I went into my little soliloquy, which I'll do very quickly now, which is to say, when people get on you about, you know, the dirty word became affirmative action, right, or quotas or whatever, give them a little history lesson, which is very simple. Coming out of the 60s and the 70s, these programs that were named as such affirmative action programs, even though today people think it's for people that look like me in particular, and maybe sometimes, you know, more for, for women, but it actually, these were actually programs in large respect that were put in place to, that ended up, I should say, being utilized the most by white American females in terms of the actual percentage of effect. Now, not enough of an effect, especially in science and engineering, or we wouldn't be having this panel, right? When I look out across my classroom and I can count one, two, three women, you know, out of 55, obviously, the so-called affirmative action and opportunities didn't really, but as far as any active, any measurable effect, it was primarily for white American females. And then along the way, you might even say kind of last in that line were people that look like me. But if you say it, right, what does the media tell you or, or just friends? Oh, it's giving an opportunity to people who aren't qualified, blah, blah, blah. Let's talk about college admissions. There are actually more legacy admissions. These are the admissions of people whose dad and granddad and whatnot went to that university than there are for minorities of any type, I can assure you. So when I tell people this, if you have somebody getting on your case about you know, affirmative action, whether it's for women or minorities, the first thing I say to them is, what do you have against white women, many of whom are dear friends of mine? Not to fall into them, many of my best friends are white, they are, <laughs> but, you know, because that, their mindset is first on minority as in racially, right? 
And then we can get into talking about how there have not been that many even white American, and specifically was white American females. It didn't even extend to you know immigrants and such, right? So the bottom line I'm saying is that when people jump on these things about quotas in front of action, you can ask my husband right there. He's an attorney, also he has an MD. He's, we're, we're a geek family, right? Can't spell geek without ED. He's an MD and JD, and he can tell you about companies that illegally used so-called quotas to give the idea of we're hiring people and whatnot. Because after I say this, invariably somebody comes up to me and says, oh, I work for this government group, and they said we had to hire a woman, and we had to hire a black guy. Many times that was illegal, what they were doing, or they were using it. And I can tell you also in college admissions, um, you know, the thing that's come up to the Supreme Court, the young woman, young woman who said, like, she didn't get admitted to a Texas school. First off, she wasn't a Texas resident. And Texas, as you know, admits, like, their top 10%. Her grades were not really high enough necessarily, but she claimed that she was not given a spot in the university because she was white and these other black people got it. Note that in university admissions, much more is considered beyond race is somewhere in there, right? But a 4.0 student can maybe not get accepted, whereas a kid with a 3.5 or a 3.5 has a more well-rounded you know, set of skills to bring to the table in admissions. So it's not all about that. So they're throwing up a smoke screen at you. When I look at what Jeff Sessions is doing, like I said, mm -hmm. Dr. Paul Ray sitting there can talk about that better than I can, but they're throwing up a smoke screen when they tell you about you know, affirmative action or quotas and, and not being qualified. They do it in terms of race because that gets people going, right? But that's not really what it's about. It really is, in my opinion, about people, as has been stated, being afraid of a loss of power. In, in the bottom line to me, racism, sexism, and any other ism, or obia, you know, homophobia, et cetera, is about people afraid of losing power. So they pin it on one thing. It could be your gender, it could be your race, it could be your religion, whatever it may be. But the bottom line is, the, is fear. And kind of the only way to do, deal with that, sometimes you gotta fight it head on, Sometimes you have to engage in the conversation like we did with the lady in the group. By the time we finished talking, she was following me back to my room. We were hugging each other. She, she still was saying weird <laughs> stuff. <laughs> but, you know, you, you, got, you got to make a crack in that little, just chip away, and at, it. Just chip away at it. You know? Yeah, and that's, so that's and that's key with, with people that do express some of these un you know, negative views. It's not just about saying, oh, you're an asshole and yeah. walking away. That happens too, though. <laughs> <laughs> it feels really good. Feels really good. Yeah. Yeah. But the, if anything's going to change their opinion, it's going to be engaging with people of diverse people and realizing that they're people. And sometimes you yeah. have to know when to step back. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I did have a, a position once with a boss who was a nightmare. You know it's bad when you're a young starting out professor, assistant professor level, and full professors, so those assistant associate and full in terms of rank, and full professors, grown men, many years my senior, are in my office talking to me with tears in their eyes. I'm like, I can't do anything, you know, <laughs> to help them. So you know that's bad. That's a rough environment. We had an environment once where actually, um, I'll say technically, because one had already left, but basically you hear about like a faculty suicide at a university like once every so many years. I was in the department once where we had two. Um, in the 13 years I've been there in the same department, okay? And at one That's point- That's a toxic environment. Oh yeah yeah, 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 and the point where somebody told me that, oh, you're working for so-and-so, and they just went, he doesn't like women, he doesn't like blacks, yeah. he doesn't like Arabs, right. he doesn't like Jews, he doesn't like Catholics, I'm like, oh crap. You know, <laughs> black yeah, female yeah. Catholic who went to Jewish day camp in the summers. I'm that's dead. Dead. <laughs> you know, that's that's the kind of person I feel like. You know, if a woman walks in the room, the first thing they think is they're not qualified oh, to yeah. be here. They must be a quota hire. And I'm yeah. like, why is the default that you're like everybody else is smarter than me? Like, you d you don't you haven't even talked to me yet. You haven't even met me, and you're like already assuming that I don't have the skills for the job that I literally was just hired for. Yeah. Like there, I went through a process to get hired and I had to prove in an interview that you guys should pay me to do this. And then there's, you know, hopefully not your boss or anybody who has control over your pay, but yeah, just like these, like, like I said, microaggressions, weird little comments from people that really have nothing to do with you, but tell you everything about them. Yes. And I want, and I'm happy when those people speak out loud because I want to know who they are. Like I had a coworker, well, he's not there anymore for unrelated reasons, but sometimes they feel like, I'm unprepared and don't know how to handle certain situations and I say nothing and then I have to think about it and come back later to engage because in the moment I don't know what to say like I had a white male co-worker uh, there's a bike store uh, where I work there's like a bunch of stores it's a business road and there's a bike store 
And he came over and he goes, I just saw something I've never seen before. I saw a black person buying a bike. <laughs> and I didn't understand how this was a story. I was yeah. like, what? I don't, and, and he goes, cause in my neighborhood, they just steal them. And I was like, he literally, and I just, I did not know what to say. I was like, this is not okay. Like, but I didn't know how to engage with him. So and then he got fired for unrelated reasons shortly afterwards. So we never like, I never got to engage or finish the conversation, but in the moment I just froze. So what would be a good comeback? Now that, now that you've anybody, had a, anybody, yeah. Yeah. anybody have a, oh. I have kind of a comeback story. Okay. Not specifically to that really cool story that he should tell at parties. Uh -huh. um, but kind of a story I've been thinking of as we've been having this conversation. Um, this is a colleague of mine, a male colleague in computer science, um, who did some like pretty badass advocacy for his female colleagues that I want to tell you about because um, it really, really impressed me. Um, so he was working at a large telco in Mexico, um, and like the boss, one of the bosses, just was one of these guys who thinks you know, like women assumes that they cannot code, they cannot program, they are not talented despite being hired for the position that they are in. Um, and the guy I'm working with now, he kind of saw this happening, um, and he decided to do some sly allyship. Um, when this boss was kind of looking for solutions to coding problems, my colleague would pass him code snippets from GitHub, be like, hey, you know, check this out. What do you think of this? Maybe you can look at this. And then once the sexist boss said, oh, yeah, this is great. This is exactly what we need. Be like, boom, written by a woman. Whoa. <laughs> so he slowly started to sneak those in and like still kind of chipping away. This guy was hard to deal with. I think it was the kind of thing you can't fire him for whatever reason. Um, I don't know this telco. So then later, apparently, they were doing a huge UI redesign. By far, the best UI designer and engineer in the company was a woman. Um, so my colleague kind of like teamed up with, with her and said, hey, we're going to do this redesign. I'm going to tell the boss that I did it. Just for now, we're going to keep it a secret. And then at the key moment, we're going to pull back the curtain and reveal that a woman wrote this. And he did this. Apparently, the UI redesign was a huge success. Surprise, a woman wrote it, mic drop. And apparently, they, re they reformed this guy to some extent. Um, but even that, and like, I was thrilled by this story, but also saddened that we have to like trick people and like surprise them with this. Um, so you know, what, what is a good response? Maybe there is none, but that was one that was creative and seemed to work in the environment that my colleague was in, which is not all environments. Um, and I think often like the, the best, a, a fine response is like, I don't know what to do. Um, I'm thinking of a lot of stories when we talk about quotas kind of being, as, being assumed that you're part of a quota, being told directly, hey, you're on this panel so we don't have a mantle. Like, that's happened to me several times. Like, hey, you're not a dude and you don't have a beard. Come be on this panel. Um, and how do you respond? I don't know. Like, I don't have a good answer. I just do this. Yeah. 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 I can't, I can't believe you said that. I can't I, believe you said yeah, that. Yeah, but, but I want to be on this panel, so okay. <laughs> yeah, I see, I see somebody who might have a better idea than me. Um, and so basically, oh, hey, it's Mike. Um, so, but yeah, so um, what she would say is just, why did you just say that to me? Or if it was so, uh, someone that was like on her level or below, she would say, I can't believe you just said that to me. And she'd base it on the situation. It's a lot harder to deal with if it's a superior or if it's at work where it has an environment where everybody's very like, you know, straight laced by the book. It's a lot harder. But what she said is the thing that she, even if it didn't change the other person's mind, they didn't talk about it, nothing, just the fact that she wasn't silent made her feel Don't like she silent. was doing something helpful. Absolutely. Thank you. I, I just say, I don't understand, and then get them to explain themselves. <laughs> say, what? I don't understand. I just give them a confused look. And then they have to go further process. than their joke. What? Yeah. So you can understand more of their thought process? Yeah, yeah. and then they have to explain it. And then I can have a conversation with them. Yeah. Or so they Challenge can understand their thought process, too. Challenge I've also had a engage. lot of, like, well, you know, we needed to bring a woman or a person of color. Not that you're not totally qualified. Uh -huh. Like, are you saying what I think you're saying? You're saying two things. Like, <laughs> so I don't understand would be a great response to that. I, I will fight it uh, very quietly in a very ladylike way. We had this happen when the first black hire, a fireman was hired at the city where I worked. 
and it was he got it through affirmative action and the word went through the programming crew because we were on the same floor don't talk to him he's just affirmative action that got me so mad now the fire department's office was right next to the programming pit I'd stick my head in and go hi guys hi Sam every morning and pretty soon Sam would stop by the programming pit hi Mel hi guys <laughs> after a while everybody got to talking it came home to roost when we had a fire and the kid next door it was a black family and there was family violence he was accused of setting the fire and he had and the woman next door said the lady who reported it there you know or I did actually didn't know who started it, but the lady over there is, is a racist. The fireman she talked to was Sam. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he said, lady, I know her. <laughs> that wasn't it. But that's the way I tend to address it. Uh, a lot of times, not only people of color, but disabled people. And in anthropology, this is called see them as being human. If you see that other person as human, you can influence others around you to see them as human. The poison here is not the one person. It's that they will create culture. Yes. Yes. And if you see and acknowledge others as human, transgender, whatever, by seeing them as human, you empower the others around them who are willing to see them as human, and you can change culture. Beautiful. Now, that's my approach. Beautiful. Everybody has their own stuff. That's where it works for me. So I wanted to give a, a chance for questions and stuff. Did anyone have questions or comments? Hand her the box. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not as much of a question, but I just wanted to bounce off an idea that uh, Dr. White uh, mentioned in her introduction when it seemed a lot of people were interested in the idea of seniors being able to take college courses to, for free. Um, and the idea that I wanted to kind of throw out there for anyone that knows any high school kids and the idea of getting more girls and kids interested in science and technology in general. Um, I was very lucky enough 20 something years ago when I was growing up in Southern California and I believe several states do this. Um, most community colleges offer a dual enrollment program. Mm -hmm. So if you have any high school kids that you know that might be interested um, I spent my high school summers taking college classes in physics and biology and things like that to get ahead. So I just wanted to throw that out. <laughs> and can I to follow up from what you said, I want to encourage the ones who can get girls into science are the grandparents. Parents are overloaded with every freaking thing in the universe. Grandparents <laughs> often have the money the time and the interest to find things to take the kids to or even if you don't have the money Great take point. them out bug hunting yes. let them go chase grasshoppers you that the older you are you, the more power you have to help make this possible not so much the young teachers older people think about it that's fantastic well i've always thought that the gateway drug to uh, science and engineering <laughs> is is reading science fiction and watching science fiction. And so if, if you encourage kids to, to read, and sci especially read the science fiction, the good science fiction, then when they're interested in that, then the next step for them is to be interested in science and engineering and math and everything. Do you have any like specific favorite book or show you'd like to recommend? Um, well, not really. I mean, I'm, I'm, of course, partial to Star Trek. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and and you know I love Star Wars too, but yeah. the, th the thing. <laughs> let me finish. The thing that Star Trek brings that Star Wars doesn't. Star Wars is space fantasy. It's not science fiction. Uh, but Star Trek it was so forward looking, and you have the whole concept of infinite diversity and infinite combinations. And that's what we need for our future. And and I still believe that Gene Roddenberry was on the right path there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Lots of um, so this kind of actually goes on to the. Can you? This was kind of parallel going off of the next the question that was brought up before. Um, I've read in a couple different places and statistics that we're getting a lot more college graduates that are females in uh, STEM uh, certain degrees and things. But that where we're getting more of the turnover is in that young age yes. of their career. 
So even though we're getting more and more graduates, um, we're starting to drop off once they kind of hit that age where people are starting to start families of their own or even where they start having trouble moving up those chains. What are some ways that you would suggest to either uh, combat that for someone who's a young professional like myself or what are ways that you can help support other people who are in that position? Can I throw in a, a two bits on that? Um, actually, even backing up to, to girls, um, anything is, is beautiful. Thanks, thank you so much. I, I think we're related. <laughs> but, but even growing up, one of the, my parents were ele uh, elementary school teacher, mom, high school math teacher for dad. And my mom's mantra is, it's just today's her birthday, as a matter of fact, can't say how old she'll come out and beat me, but in her 80s. Um, her mantra was exposure. So it gets, Dr. White said, take them out and see bugs, right? But the drop-off does occur. There, there, it's actually data to show that whether it's like the middle school range, it's shown for boys versus girls, it's shown by race and so forth. And if you, one of the things we always talk about is have the data. So just like this, you know, the crazy Google letter, this person had data, right? You can also find real data as to, as you said, these drop-offs and what can you do. One thing I would say is as much as we've talked about, you know, certainly the pain, there is also the pleasure and the accomplishment in, you know, loving, I love, I love science and I can remember. So um, getting kids exposed, even if they're not into science. I don't, I, we had a, a session for middle school girls back at, in Baton Rouge where we, um, they brought in um, like 400 middle school girls. And if you haven't seen it, I got to throw out there, see the movie Hidden Figures. Oh, yeah. If you, or, and show it to a friend. I mean, I, 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 I'm not of the generation where I was the age to be, but I can, I relate to some, I was bawling. I was a, you know, I had to go in the restroom and my son said, are you okay? Fine. Ran, <laughs> you know, because there's so much I relate to. But to, to back to your question is, there is data you can look up. I'm sorry, I don't have the citations off the top of my head, but maybe we can talk later, where you can find where those drop-offs are. And what you've got to do is, as they say, hit people where they live. So if it's little kids, it might be taking them out just to see stuff. You know, there's plenty of free stuff for the libraries, right? If it's young women in college, you have to make sure that they get exposed to this. This is wonderful. There's so much of this that I can say, at least for me, and I, for others may agree, we didn't have, you know, at all. Almost every conference that I go to, um, they talk about work-life balance for women, even though they don't talk about it for men, but it's coming, right? And so you have to give people that safe space to talk. Like where that young woman says, you know, I really want to be X, but, you know, I want to have the family and do X. And I'm like, you can do both, why not? Sometimes it's just a cultural thing. In her family, it may be that the women stayed home with the children, and she's the ground breaker not to do it. In my family, I think, even going back to slavery, if you will, I, I, I don't hardly anybody got to stay home. I mean, you, you had to, you know, I think my grandmother did at one point, but in our family, the culture was as such, you were proud to go and do something because it was something like, you know, my folks, the, the big thing you could do in New Orleans as a, as a Negro, as we said at the time, was to be a, a school teacher or work for the post office, because these were steady jobs. And so then to have the next generation that can go on into, you know, get PhDs, and I'm telling my sons, we have more degrees than a thermometer in this family. Somebody, <laughs> somebody go make some money, start a company, seriously. So you have to find where those, those breakdowns are. My husband and I have actually gone into our son's schools and talked with the teachers at certain grade levels and said, very honestly, we understand that many times X is not um, uh, expected of black males, but we expect this of our son and we want to make sure that you do as well. And you can do the same thing for your daughters. So for whatever reason, you've got to find maybe where that young person or young woman is starting to get a little iffy. And if you can, it, as a friend or if it's just you, find things like this where you have a safe space to talk to people. And I'm more than happy, people, I live on email. I'll give anybody my email address. And if, you, and if it's something I don't know, you know, I can maybe put you in touch with things and people that can help you with that aspect. Because these are real issues and hard questions that women have to deal with many times over and beyond their partners. Um, even, if, even if you have a partner that's female, as a friend of mine just said, she has a wife and she goes, but she's useless, you know, in terms of, even though she loves her dearly, I guess, but in terms of making those decisions. So you have to find, if you will, like-minded people, but like helpful people. <laughs> oh, just one thing quick. Um, you mentioned hidden figures in the movie. The movie's fantastic, but if you haven't read the book, you have to read the book. Yeah. yeah. Because it is so much better, and it covers such a longer time frame, and it really shows you how amazing these women were. 
and the granddaughter of that woman is a uh, school teacher in Baton Rouge. I got to take a picture with her. Oh, She's wow. the, uh, the school, the granddaughter of the main character. Oh, I'm sorry, Aldi has helped me. The main character, um, the mathematician. I can't believe him. I'm sorry. Was it? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Thank you. It takes a village. Yes. <laughs> Real quick announcement. I'm actually on the next panel. Hello. Um, sorry. Um, I work for a company, a tech company in New Orleans called Look Far, and we just opened up nominations for our third annual Ada Lovelace Awards, which celebrate women in tech. And we're expanding this year to go beyond New Orleans, so it's the entire Gulf South region. So uh, Florida, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas. So if you know any women in those states that are deserving of this award, I've got a clipboard that I can pass around if you want me to shoot you an email post Dragon Con, because yes. I know how this yes. gets. Um, you can also, if it's easier, there's a QR code on here that'll take you to the page if that's easy, or you can go to lookfar.com and it's on our homepage. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yes. So I'm an IT security security. Ah, I'm an IT security engineer. I work at uh, Carter's, which is a baby clothes company. So I was having a conversation with one of my coworkers, and I I uh, let them know that I did not want kids. And their response to me was, "Well, how else are how are you going to benefit society? Like, well, how what no what good <laughs> are you in society?" And even though that kind of jarred me at the time. Um, throughout working with that person, because he can't just walk off and quit or anything like that, but um, I changed his mind. And I was wondering, because I know that you guys probably go through things like that, it, um, as kind of a ray of hope into all of the things that we go through, what is a time that you've changed someone's mind? Mm -hmm. And how long did that take? Mm. Um, I had somebody, um, one of my first jobs was in tech support be because I w was working in marketing in an office before that and like I said I, I just fixed stuff like I didn't sometimes stuff I didn't realize it was a skill until I realized nobody else was doing what I was doing uh, like they would have a, like we need to do this we have this problem and I would just figure out how to make it happen and then that happened enough times that they were like oh there's this other job opening in tech support we think you'd be good for it and that was kind of my start in the field because I do have a, a degree but it wasn't in computer science like I I took classes later, but a lot of what I do is just self-taught, and my employers don't care. They care that I can get the job done. They haven't really cared about paperwork I may or may not have in certain areas. And so um, it turned out, I didn't realize, this was a big state agency that I was in. It was the biggest state agency in the state of Ohio where I was doing tech support, and I didn't know I was the only woman. And apparently, until we had a staff meeting, it was like 30 guys from all over the state and me. And that's when I realized I was the only woman. And then it was probably a few months later after that, somebody just kind of came up to me and told me, they were like, the last woman we had five years ago, she wasn't really good, but I think you've really proved yourself. Um, I didn't know I was supposed to be proving myself. I just thought I was supposed to like show up and do my job like everybody else that works and has a job. So I think that was kind of an instance where I apparently changed somebody's mind and that was good, but it was not on purpose. I just, you know, I guess it was just living your life the, uh, the best way possible. And it's nice if other people just kind of happen to notice that. You just approach what you can. I mean, I, I, I have the optimism. I want to have the optimism. I'm a you know, person who I believe in God, there's a, there's a faith, but uh, and I don't mean a but to that, but essentially you have the optimism of changing and affecting the world, but then sometimes the world might be just be two or three people around you and that's good enough. You just be the best you can be and you may never hear about it, but they may find, oh, that, that little girl, as they may think of you, right? <laughs> that little girl is not so bad. Or other times it can be years. I have a colleague who is in his 80s and he talks about, he's a white male, and he says, you know, when he grew up, his the N word was pretty regular in his family. He grew up in, you know, Brooklyn, and and uh, long story short, he had a friend, a black friend, right? But who over many years talked and talked about things. They were close enough. It just he's he he is more like fighting for women and minorities and everything than I think I could even muster, right? And it took many years for that. So you don't really know. But all you can do is, you know, as Dr. White said, protect your soul. As Jeannie said, find an ally, because actually a thing happened where we had to deal with someone, we needed to 
not get a job. And I knew if I talked about it, it would sound like, oh, the whiny black person. But I told my colleague, and he did sort of like, you know, Jeannie's colleagues, and sort of let the other folks know this person isn't right. Sometimes it can't just be you. So just be aware of, and then sometimes you just have to stand for what you are and believe. I mean, I, I had a colleague recently I met who said when she was a small kid, decided not to have kids, you know? And that's her decision and her right. So if they don't agree or they say something stupid to you, you just put it on your stupid board. You know, there's a, <laughs> there's a stu you know, so it's just put a little mark there by their name and, and you know, hope they get better because it's not you, it's them. Yeah. One brief additional note. Um, we're talking a lot about, you know, convincing other colleagues who are not perhaps women or people of color. Also convince other women. Oh my gosh, I have had, yeah. the first thing I thought of was I convinced a friend that she could code. At the same time, she convinced me that I could code, and it was beautiful. <laughs> um, we're best friends now. Um, we wrote a script, our professors in grad school told us it should take like five minutes. We got it to take 10 seconds, we were like, oh god, this can't be right. <laughs> what did we miss? And we're like combing through this, we're like, no, no, we missed it. We eventually showed it to, um, Professor's like, okay, you gotta help us out. What did we miss here? I know we're not supposed to debug code with you because your time is very valuable. We're like, come on, 10 seconds. He's like, can I use this? It's like, yes. <laughs> um, but this friend and I, you can kind of support other women around you, right? Like having allies, I think that is a huge part of the battle. Um, I know I was told my whole life that I just wasn't very good at math and I believed it until I wrote that 10 second code. And now I am good at math. <laughs> but it is, and I needed someone to help me and it's often another woman. Well, I think just being at places like this, this is why I talk at a lot of science fiction and Doctor Who conventions, is because just that people can see that women do this job. Mm -hmm. Because when people think a NASA engineer, they, they usually, you know, they think a white guy, older white guy. And so I just like to get out there and show that, that women, women can do this. Anybody can do this. Because I think if I can do it, anybody can do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, she's a senior now, um, so it's a little, it, but I have to encourage her. One of the things that when you say you're sending your child to a STEM school is that the this S, the last question, yeah, the S of the STEM seems to get lost, and it's always the focus on, at least with her school, is the technology, the engineering, and math, of which she was interested in none of it. So I have to explain to her that there's more to being a scientist than just those three things. You, she wants to be an anthropologist. Yeah. And there's geology, and there's the biology, and there's all of that. And her school wasn't getting it at first until her last two years, and they started broadening the whole science thing. So I think that really needs to be emphasized sometimes, that science is not just the math, the engineering, the IT, and all of that, because there are a lot of girls that aren't, that's where you lose them sometimes. That's just kind of a comment, so. get STEAM. When they do STEM, now we're spending the A for STEAM. And so I've had talks where I've told girls like going to be a chef or a fashion designer or, you know, a landscape artist or anything. All of those areas, there was a session, unfortunately I missed it about women at NASA. Maybe Kim can talk later. To I was on that. It. Okay. <laughs> but but I, had, I was at a talk once where another woman from NASA had these young girls yell out what they wanted to be, and she said everything they had named, you know, people in fashion design, people in the arts, people in, you know, culinary arts, all these things are part of jobs that are done, for example, at NASA and other places. So the A in STEAM is very much linked to the ST, you know, EM. You just have to find out where, and we can talk later. What's the, what is the A in STEAM? It stands for arts now. Arts. They're saying okay. STEAM right. instead of just STEM. Okay. If anybody's, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Last comment. Um, <laughs> just if anybody's interested on the way out of anything like Dragon Con related, I talked about in my intro, Marriott carpet, Dragon Con rooms, eternal members, any of that <laughs> stuff, I have like cards with resources on it. All right. And, I, and I've got flyers for Freaknik, which is the 
the TechCon in Nashville that'll be in about a month. And um, so, uh, closing note, women in science and tech. So we seem to have um, this older layer that is sometimes resistant, but the younger layer, we're still rising up anyway. So on that note, keep up the good fight.